title of the message, Be Careful, Little Lips, What You Say. Remember that old song, Be Careful, Little Eyes, What You See. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. For your Father up above. careful little there won't be joining the choir anytime soon thank you <laughs> don't go too far away just sit where you are it's going to be very short I just winked at him that don't mean I'm lying My brethren, let not, James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. James is making it very clear he's trying to get something across to people. And I want you to have this before we leave here tonight. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also, he says, at ships. Although they are so large, they are driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. But listen to verse 9. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same, same opening? Can a fig tree by my brethren bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace with our words. I wanted to leave with you tonight, and, and before we go from here, I want to pour something down into your spirit about your words in a day, in an hour, in a, a society, in a culture like we live in now, this is a message that I can't believe I've never preached. I've never, and I'm not going to be able to preach the whole thing. I'll, I'll preach it later on. But in a culture like we live in where there's Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, which I like, and Facebook, I said that, and texting and FaceTime, I mean, I've never, the communication is unbelievable. Now more than ever before, we need to watch our words. The Bible's making it very clear here for us 
Especially when we read in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, it said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can speak death out of your mouth or you can speak life out of your mouth. Be careful the conversations you have with your loved ones, with your co-workers, with your friends, with your family, with your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband. Be careful the conversations that you have. Be careful what stands in the way of your heart. Sometimes words can get in the way. Sometimes without real desire or acknowledgement or even consideration, to the words that you're using, you might, you might just get what you say. Be careful, little lips, what you say. Casting Crowns in a song called Slow Fade used these words, said, be careful, little lips, what you say, for empty words and promises lead broken hearts astray. Words are so important in our life. Words are important in our worship. They're important in our conversations, our relationships, words. We always talk about a communication problem, but really I thought about this and I thought we really can't say that much anymore because technically we're all communicating. Everybody's communicating. I know when you've stubbed your toe. I know when you're late for work. I know when you got to run by Kroger's on the way home. I know where you went to eat last night. I know where you'll eat tonight after church. You check in everywhere. And you check out everybody else's Facebook too. I'll never forget the time I was traveling down I-75 with my family in a five-car convoy headed to Gatlinburg, and I was being a little smart with the accelerator, and I ended up going too fast and got pulled over by a sheriff, and there's all my family passing by laughing at me. What was worse was that by the, I'm sitting in the car, the sheriff is writing me a ticket, and I'm getting text messages from Stratford Heights, ha, 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 you got a ticket. We don't have a prob problem with communication. There is no problem with communication. The problem, Brother Barnes, is our words. Our words. James chapter 1 and verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. You mean I can be involved in church, I can go to every service, I can be on every ministry team, but if I've not learned how to bridle my tongue, my religion is useless? This is the word of God. He said that your words are so powerful, the parallel and the illustration that James used, inspired of God, writing the word of God. He said it's like when we put a bit in a horse's mouth. How can a 170 pound man control a 2,000 pound horse with one little bit in his mouth? He can pull to the right and the horse will go to the right. He pulls to the left and the horse will go to the left. He can pull back on it and that horse will stop woe in its tracks. You and I do not realize James said the words out of your mouth are as powerful as the bit in a horse's mouth. It's like he said, a ship, a large ship that has a small rudder. But yet the man sitting, sitting up in the cabin's quarters, way up in the top of the ship. I was on a cruise this last year and 
middle of the night around two o'clock, I was out off the balcony, I was looking up at the cabin where the, where the captains and the admirals are and all those people that, and they were busy at work standing behind the counter up there running this ship that had over 2,000 people in it. When I got off the ship on one of the ports, I remember going to the back of the ship and looking to look down there and see that there's, there's just this, according to what we understand, there's just two little blades that are minute compared to the size of that ship that that man sitting up in the top literally just pushes buttons. They don't have big wheels anymore. They push buttons and the rudder turns that big old ship. Which way? This way and that way. James said, so is the power of your words. It's already 10 minutes. Five more. So is the power of your words. So I won't preach. I won't preach 12 pages. But I will say this tonight. He made those comparisons. He wanted us to understand what it's like. He wants us to understand that the metaphor he's using is the, is the parallel to how important our words are. If James thought it important enough in the word of God to give us these examples and to help us to understand the power of our words, we ought to be really careful. Parents, you ought to be careful what you say to your kids. Husbands, you ought to be real careful in the fit of anger what you say to your wife. Words have power. They can drive that marriage left and right. Be careful what you say to one another. Be careful what you say to your brother and your sister when you've got a jealous spirit down in your heart. Be careful the things you say to somebody in the altar or somebody out in the hall or somebody that's just made you mad. Be careful what you open your mouth and let loose because the Bible says the tongue is an evil thing and him who has not learned to bridle it. His religion is useless. Useless. There ought to be a whole, a whole message series on the power of the tongue. Seeing people hurt others with their mouth. Go on and forget all about it. I, I was in a situation, it wasn't from our church as a regional elder, I was in a situation where a man had hurt someone, hurt a lady in the church, had just, she went home crying was all upset, took her a week to get over it. She's never forgot about it. And if you asked her about it tonight, she'd tell you about it, how much it wounded and hurt her. As regional elder, I went to this gentleman because he was a leader and I, I said, man, I said, what was this? You, you had this, this encounter, this conversation and man, these words that came out of your mouth, you, you hurt this woman. Well, I did not. You don't remember saying these words? No, I, I didn't say that. Sir, there's two other people that were standing there that heard you say these words. Well, if I did, I, I didn't mean it like that. Well, then maybe you ought to go to her and relieve her because for weeks now she's been wounded and hurt over your words that you forgot about. Sometimes people will speak things into your spirit. People will speak a careless word. I've had it done in my own life. I've had people speak things into my life and it's a negative thing and it, it works against me and it tries to identify me and label me and it causes me to feel insecure and it causes me to, to not be able to relate to others. I've had these experiences in my life. I'll never forget at Lee University when I had a professor, one of my professors, I loved him and I was graduating. It was my senior year and I was in my senior exit interview and stood there, sat there as he was across the desk from me and he was checking off his interview form and he said all these good things and then he got down to the word leader and he said right there he said well he says you're not you're not a good leader he said you're just not a leader he said you're everything on my thing was 
9, 10, 9, 10, 9, 10 on a scale of 1 to 10, 9, 10. And he got down to leader and he put a 7. He said, you're just not a leader. That's not been developed in you. And I sat there and I remember as a senior in college, Brother Rex, I remember I walked out of there and I said, I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader. And that plagued me and identified me. I didn't know it. I didn't walk out of there going, check that, I'm not a leader. It got down in my spirit. And I'll never forget when God was speaking to me about nine years ago in the youth ministry in the back. And I was standing there one night and we had the room was full of young people. We had gotten to about 120 that night and I was so thrilled. And I remember standing there and the Lord says, are you ready for the next step? And I was just like, oh yes, I'm ready for the next step. And he spoke to my heart in prayer that night and he said, I want you to study leadership. It said several things to me. I, I thought, you know, he was wanting to give me a great direction for what to do with them youth leaders or what to do with the young people, what kind of big message to preach. He said, no, 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 it's you. I want you to study leadership. And I remember in my own spirit in that moment, I was like, I'm not a leader. How can I study that or be that? I'm a youth pastor. That's the leader that I am. And I began to study leadership. And once I got into that, God began to develop me and put me in line with mentors and people that would pour into me. And I discovered that leaders have to be made, that they're, that they're made. And it's not something that anybody can identify you or tell you you aren't something. They, they can't do that to you. But this gentleman doesn't even know. He probably forgot all about that. He checked his interview sheet and he put it away in the folder and he walked on out into his life. But he never understood or knew in those minutes, few seconds that he spoke those words over me, that it identified me and changed me, labeled me. I knew that it was true and how it had worked in my life when one of my peers, a fellow minister, looked at me and said, you have a problem identifying in, with, with your peers. You, you're more comfortable with teenagers. You're, you're not comfortable with other ministers. And I knew that it was something that had labeled me and crushed me. And I fought hard since I realized it was a lie. I fought hard to change that in my life. People have spoke things. This is what I want to get to you, get across to you tonight before you leave here. People have spoke things into your life. People have told you what you are. They've told you what you are not. They have labeled you. And they have, by doing so, crushed part of your own spirit. Words. Words. Careless words have affected you, have stopped you, have crushed you. Don't you let it go another night. Because words also have the power to bless, to edify, and to build up. Words also have a way, the scriptures are filled with, with, with promises for you and I that you are the head and not the tail. That you are blessed, that you are not cursed. You've come from an abusive situation that has identified you most all of your life, but God has set you free from that. His word over you is victory. His word over you is healing. His word over you is deliverance. His word over you is strength, power. God wants you. To understand that the power of the words that have been spoken over you do not have to identify you any longer. And if I could get to the end of my message, man, I would show you. If the Bible says, a Psalms 31 woman says she opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. I'm telling you, you let God get in there and heal you of the words. Let him heal you of the negative. Let him heal you of the things that have tried to crush you. Let him be your victor and he'll change you. 
He'll change your outlook and the things that come from you will be life and not death. Strength. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Colossians 3 and 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. David wrote the song in Psalm 37 when he said, I'm sorry, I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let your words heal and edify others. Let your words build up. Don't speak words of negativity any longer. Don't speak words that crush others. Don't let it come out your mouth. It's better that you be silent, but that you would be a part of negative things that tear down and rip apart a, a church or a, a pastor or a fellow brother, or fellow minister, fellow leader, fellow neighbor, a brother or a sister. Better that you would be silent than to open your mouth and rip apart and tear down. We should be anointed to bring strength and to bring life. Jesus made it clear. He said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. He said, but it's what comes out because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let your words show your heart because it will Anyway, so check your heart. Tonight, I've seen people wounded. I've seen people hurt. I've seen people ripped apart by the words of people. Perhaps you are in this house and you've been hurt. Words have crushed your own spirit. There ain't nothing worse. The Bible talks about the wounds of a brother or sister or friend. There's nothing worse than that. As he's leading us in authority, he's teaching us about authority. We need to understand the authority that is in our words. Was it not words that God used when he created the whole world, Vic? He spoke and the worlds were, were created. Was it not words that Jesus spoke over Lazarus in a tomb dead of four days? Lazarus. Was it not Moses and Aaron standing in the wilderness when God instructed them to do a mighty miracle in front of the people that God said, speak. No show. No entertainment for the people. Speak. And was it not the power of words when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost? Was it not the power of words that ushered in the Holy Ghost? Don't underestimate how important your words are. Don't underestimate the power that is in the tongue. Stand with me tonight. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 says, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy words. The challenge is that we stop prophesying negatively. It wasn't going to be a big old message on gossip and slander and backbiting, although that could, I could do that one too. That'd be message number two. 
Why we wanna hurt people. Why we choose to hurt people. Why we choose to be cruel to the ones we love the most. Have you ever noticed the very ones you love the most are the ones you'll hurt with words. I am, I admit it, I'm one of them sensitive heart people. You can look at me wrong, and if I ain't in the Holy Ghost, I'll get hurt. You can speak something cruel to me and you can forget about it and go on. You won't think anything more about it. I'll lay awake for days. That's me. Marsha, I know what it is. The power of words. Not only to one another, but understand the Bible says your praise, your worship, your singing, your preaching, your teaching, useless if you've not learned to control your tongue. Life and death. If you've not learned to control it, be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. You may get what you say. That may not be the greatest quote you ever heard in your life, but I wrote it. Be careful what you say. You may just get what you say. That's why earlier, so important for us to lift up our praise. I don't want to tell you how to do that. You know, I, I made a joke several weeks back, and I, I'm going to say it right here because it's appropriate. I love this guy. I've loved him since he first bowed his knee at youth group years ago, eight years ago, giving his life back to Jesus. God called him. God anointed him. He walks in the Spirit. He preaches under the anointing. And I was joking about Ohio State, and I was saying something, and I, I was making reference, you might remember, I made a reference to him jumping up and down, being all excited about Ohio State, but I said, I don't see you moving now. I did not finish my thought. I didn't finish my words that night. Because what I was trying to do was make a connection that Brad's not this person, but I saw an excitement and exuberance in him that I see sometimes and I don't see for people who love God and I didn't finish my words. So I kind of left it hanging out there with, you worship Ohio State, but you sure don't worship God. And oh, I felt so horrible. Him and I had to, I talked to him about it. I told him how sorry I was and he was just like, that's okay. But I, I know the power of my words. I didn't finish that thought. We got off track and I didn't finish that. My words that night could have, could have labeled him or identified him, could have hurt him. It can happen to any of us when we truly are unbridled. And we've really got to watch closely and guard the issues of our own heart because you never know when something you say can be taken wrong, can hurt, can wound, and you not even mean it. So be careful little lips what you say don't be so quick to speak I would have given anything that night if I could have just finished my sentence Marcia. I would have said but he's a worshiper he's a quiet one he's very exuberant other times you never know what he's going to do it's whatever God's doing but I would have said Loving God, worshiping God, it's not in that expression. I would have said it's in this heart. 
And out of that heart comes the love and the adoration for God. And so I'm not challenging you tonight to exuberance. I'm not challenging you to excitement. I'm not saying you don't love God if you don't jump and shout and skip and dance. I'm not saying you don't love him. If you do that, that's great. It's awesome. I'm liable to do anything. What I am saying is, check your words. Because whether it's in your spirit, real quiet, and you're off in a corner somewhere over here, not making a big old spectacle, Maybe you're a quiet worshiper. Maybe you're a crier. Maybe you're somebody who meditates. Maybe you're somebody who gets a hold of God with your eyes closed. That's all right. You're welcome here. You're part of us, man. That can be as deep and rich an experience and intimacy with God as anything else. But the important thing is this. Worship. Whether it's quiet or whether you want to run for a spell, whether you shout and you dance, or you just sit there quietly in the pew and let the Holy Spirit just saturate you. However you do it, however God blesses you, worship. Guard your words and don't let an opportunity of praise go by don't ever just sit there and say nothing. Don't ever come to God's house and just sit there and do nothing. Don't ever be in His presence and not acknowledge Him with something. Words. Words. They're important. It's important that you know I love you. It's important you know I'm proud of you. It's important you know you're a gift to us from God. It's important the leadership in you. It's important the things that God is speaking of your life. It's important that I say them to you and that you say them back and that we say them to one another. It's important. Do you believe that? Say amen. If you say amen, I'll quit. Well, that was the shortest 10-minute message I've ever preached. Father, I ask you to touch us tonight. I believe, Lord, we need to really look into this. And I challenge our people to go home and study this this week, especially as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving. For, Lord, we need to have a heart of gratitude. We need to live in a thankfulness for our friends. It'll make a whole lot of peace in this world if we'll just start thanking people. If we'll just start loving people and putting out good words and prophesying, edifying wonderful strength over their lives deliverance over their lives and promise oh god i just pray that you'll touch us tonight help us to move in this power of your work in us and the work that comes out of us that god is through our words most of all our words one of the greatest tools you have use us bless us anoint us I pray this prayer tonight over us, especially as we enter the holidays. Challenge our families to more love. Challenge them to words, good words. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you tonight. Spirit.